treatment. My name is Natalia Calloway. I'm an ophthalmologist, specifically a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon. So with that disclosure, surgeons can be wrong. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about sex and gender differences in vision. So as an ophthalmologist, I study vision from looking inside of the eye, but actually a lot of the research related to vision and specifically sex and gender differences in vision is in the neurological world, which works well with my background because I was a neuroscience major in undergrad. So although I'm not a PhD, as you all are, I would love to you know, work with and meet anyone else that's interested in this field because there's so much more that's needed in this arena. The real question we're trying to answer is, do men and women see the world differently? I come from a fairly conservative surgical environment, and when I ask people in my field or I tell them what I'm working on, I kind of get this nod like, oh, you had so much potential. Why would you look into this? You know, This is not something you're going to find. I've had people be like, there is no difference. You're wasting your time. I think that maybe there is, and I think that certainly it's worth looking into. Like Marsha mentioned in the introduction, we're talking about precision med medicine with all these GWAS studies. We're looking into people down to mic micrometers of drusen or levels of the retinal layers, and yet we're not talking about huge differences in gender or sex. And I also work in kind of the areas of race and uh, access to care disparities. So just this whole idea of diseases may be individualized to a patient based on what their environmental influences are and all their socio-cultural factors. So just briefly, you know, we're in a room of a neuroscience symposium. I, there are probably people in here that know more about the neurology of it than I do. But the components of the visual system are that there is the eye, so the you know, intraocular portion, and that transmits inf information to the neurological portion that's primarily located in the occipital cortex but it's a very neurologically widespread and complicated system. So we, at base, we are really visual creatures. So I think that understanding our visual system helps us better understand ourselves and diseases later that occur. So fundamentally, vision, how does it work? Light comes in, it's in a diffuse form, and it's refracted by your cornea, the part you would touch if you poke the front of your eye, as well as your lens, which is the part that you maybe heard people get cataracts. And it's focused on the back of your eye, the retina, and if you are hyperopic or myopic, nearsighted, farsighted, we move that focal point to, to center on your retina. And the retina, I would argue, is the most beautiful structure in the human body. I have the privilege of looking at it every single day. It gives me information about systemic health of an individual. I can usually tell their age if they have diabetes, high blood pressure, just by looking at their eye. I can get a pretty good idea of you know, a lot of other comorbid medical conditions, but at this point, I can't really detect if this fundus is, second, is a woman's or a man's. And I'm not sure if that's because I don't know what to look for or if there really is no difference. So that's what really prompted this area of investigation for me, but in doing so, I learned a lot more about vision differences in the entire neurological system. So the retina is beautifully organized. It's, it's a carpet on the back of your eye. It's a neurological sensory system. And we have these incredible images of the retinal cell layers. And in the outer layers, we see the photoreceptor cells. And the photoreceptors come in two populations. And pardon me if you already know this information, but just to make sure we're talking about the same thing when I'm talking about sex differences, there are two populations of these uh, photoreceptor cell bodies. The rods, which is your peripheral vision, classically associated with low lighting, scotopic vision, as well as motion perception. And then in the center, we have cones clustered. And these are our high acuity and our color vision. And all of the retinal ganglion cells coalesce their axons into the optic nerve that juts out of the eye and goes through these beautiful optic radiations throughout the neurological system. The actual components or the parts that are transmitted from the retinal ganglion cells, the kind of contrast and acuity portions of it are organized in the occipital cortex, and that's kind of something that drew me originally to neuro neuroscience as well as medicine, because I thought the organization of this and all the experiments that you know, maybe some of you have come across were incredible. Um, but they're, they are widespread in their reach and their innervation. They innervate circadian rhythms, emotional responses, motor responses for your reaction time. So it really touches on so many components of our neurological system, which is amazing, but it also makes it complicated to study. Because now anytime you're measuring vision or talking about vision differences, you are looking at 
the health of the eye, you're looking at the health of the neurologic system, but you're also considering um, the kind of the gender aspect of it as well. And you really can't fully untangle this picture because there is no animal or primate model that has the exact same retina as a human, specifically the macula, which is the center of our vision. And, and by the time you can measure visual acuity in a child, they've already started to be socialized because our fovea, the center of our vision, takes four to six months to develop. And you know that the moment a baby is born, maybe less so now, but even just 10 years ago, they're immediately wrapped in a pink or blue blanket and told they're either beautiful or handsome. And so they're being socialized from the start and they're both beautiful and handsome. But the point is that as soon as we can measure vision, they've already been socialized. So there's always these elements to consider. But researchers have done a pretty good job trying to figure out what, which is which. So how do we measure vision? I'm sure I see a lot of glasses in the audience, which I love. That means people are seeing their eye doctors. You get checked with the Stellan Acuity chart. We have the highest contrast letters. They're in standardized optotypes. So these optotypes that we measure actually subtend a standardized arc on your retina. And that's how we determine what your visual acuity is. And population studies demonstrated that the average visual acuity for somebody that has no pathology in their eye was 20-20. But it's possible to have better than 20-20 vision. And maybe somebody will brag about it. I have 20-20 vision when I'm monocular, but when I use both eyes or binocular, I'm 20-15. Um, so it's, it is possible. That was just a baseline that was set based on a standard curve. Other kind of modalities for measuring vision that um, we see a lot in the literature related to sex differences are contrast sensitivity, which is the ability to distinguish an object from its background and color perception, meaning the identification of monochromatic wavelengths of light. So there are a lot of other things you can look into with visual processing that get very complex. I stayed away from that in this talk because they start recruiting other areas that make the interpretation of the data even more complex. So rotating objects in your head, reaction times, motion perception, now you're talking about recruiting kind of prefrontal cortex, emotion responses, motor cortex. So I tried to keep it at just vision as much as I could today. So in 1979, McGinnis et al. came up with this idea of could there be differences in contrast sensitivity between men and women? I'm going to get to visual acuity. I know that's the one that everyone would most obviously think of. But contrast sensitivity, so your ability to distinguish this object. And when they first did the test, they found no difference between males and females. They said, OK, maybe there's no difference. But then they incorporated an element of spatial frequency, which I thought was really interesting. So we use this spatial frequency testing in newborns. What it is is sinusoidal waves, and the top, the peak of this wave is pure black, and then the wave around it is the kind of gradient of gray until the trough of white. And what we do is we measure this in babies that can't talk yet. So we have one side that is gray, and one side that has these sinusoidal waves. And that's how we interpret their visual acuity. They have preferential looking towards a pattern. So they will look at a pattern up to their level of visual acuity. And once it is gray on both sides for them, we know that that means they can no longer distinguish the two lines or distinguish the contrast sensitivity. So they did this test between men and women. And they found in the sample that women had better contrast sensitivity at lower spatial frequencies, and men had better contrast sensitivity at higher spatial frequencies, which is interesting because it, it starts bringing in this concept of a global versus a local form of vision as your baseline. And this is something, it's a theme that's reiterated throughout vision research when you look into sex differences. There have been studies since that have confirmed that finding, and there have been others that did not. So like all of this literature is generally underpowered, where there's a lot that we need to do more to understand this better. But it did kind of bring up a really interesting question. Could it be that the first kind of skeleton or the canvas that we lay our visual acuity data on is different between men and women? 
If so, if what would a flower with leaves in the background look like if you had better vision at low spatial sensitivity? You would generally see kind of broad outlines of this entire picture in different gradients. And then you would add on those perfect cones to add on the visual, the high acuity and your color vision. Whereas if you really focus on high spatial sensitivity, you are primarily creating your environment with the contrast of lines of black on white. So you almost get outlines of shapes and figures. Like if you were looking at this room, you would really emphasize the door and the chairs. And so that could be the base, and that could be a potential base where men and women may have differences in how they initially start to process vision. So of course, like I mentioned, visual acuity. When I first saw this talk, I thought, there's no difference between men and women in visual acuity. If there is, that means you didn't diagnose their eye disease. And you know, that's kind of a simple answer. But interestingly, people have already conducted studies where they looked at healthy and normal individuals. So these individuals have, are healthy systemically. They had ophthalmic exams that were normal. They have at least 20-20 vision. And then within that group, they measured how many people have better than 2020 vision. So what proportion of people have better than 2020 vision? And interestingly, it was not a large difference. It was about two to three letters, but men, a larger portion of men had slightly higher visual acuity or su super threshold, that 2015, 2012, 2010 visual acuity, which is interesting. But even more interesting to me was what happened when they turned the lights down. So when we test visual acuity, we always optimize the environment to standardize it, of course. We give you know, the, the patient or the subject of a study the full lighting, brightness, and then we test their visual acuity of a black letter on a white background. But these researchers, they turned down the lights, and they, which was effectively recruiting more of the peripheral retina. It was recruiting those rods to see what happens under dim conditions. And not only did that effect between males and females decrease, actually it reversed. So now a greater proportion of women had slightly better visual acuity. So it's really interesting because anytime you look, I think, into the, the differences in between the sexes, it always goes back to this hunter's gatherers theory. And you know whether you can prove it or not, you, I mean, you can't prove it, but whether you believe it or not, it certainly is something interesting to pontificate. Why would there be a potential difference in vision? Could there have been evolutionary pressures for even within the same species, the sexes to have differences in their vision and that those differences, those very subtle differences may have been advantageous enough to actually create a sex difference in visual processing? The idea here is, or the, the proponents of this theory state, you know, hunters, they had to have, they, it was, all the stakes were on them having very high focal visual acuity. They were aiming to kill. They couldn't take many shots. If they missed, maybe they wouldn't make it. They wouldn't be fit. And it was usually during the daylight. So maybe under bright conditions, they had high focal visual acuity. Whereas women, more often gatherers in this scenario, were kind of looking over larger landscapes. They were gathering, but they had to constantly be gathering, perhaps you know, fruits or nuts or vegetation. And this was probably done under shaded conditions, jungles or ferns. And there may have been preference for people that could find things under suboptimal or non-bright lighting conditions. Whether this is true or not, we, we still need to do a lot more research to figure it out, but it's certainly an interesting theory for why the visual acuity may be different in different lighting conditions. When I first heard about the topic of sex differences in vision, the first thing that came to my mind was X-linked red-green blindness. We, we may know that one in 12 males sees red and green differently than the rest of the population. Um, suboptimally, uh, according to you know, the chromatic testing. But really, I think the interesting finding here is what happens among people that are considered to have normal color perception vision testing? So for those that don't know, 
just briefly, color vision, we all humans have three cone options. So we have blue for short wavelength of light, and that's on chromosome seven, but the other two, so two thirds of our photopigment genes are on the X chromosome. And of course, this creates the possibility of sex differences. Um, those are the medium green and the red long wavelengths. And you'll notice on that little chromosome map that on the X chromosome, not only are both two thirds of the photo genes on there, they are actually very close to each other. And that becomes important in, in kind of hy hypotheses that scientists have generated related to color vision research. So when we look at the evolution of color and color perception in primates, we see that the further we get from our ancestral tree, the more likely they are to be dichromatic, although there are kind of point mutations found in monkeys at all levels um, that make them trichromatic. But as we get closer to our human um, ancestors, we find that more and more are trichromatic. So the current theory that seems to be leading the, the charge in the color vision literature is that we actually underwent a duplication event, that we were originally dichromatic, and that at some point, the, some, a monkey one day woke up and they could see the red berry on the green leaf, because on the X chromosome, this gene duplicated. And then that kind of a support for that argument is that the red and the green spectra are very close together. In fact, they're only one and sometimes three amino acid difference from each other. That's why they're so much closer than the blue that seems so far away. It's actually only 30, milli 30 nanometers in wavelength. And so, of course, this would offer a fitness advantage. And so it may be that a relatively recent, at least in evolutionary terms, ancestor of ours underwent this gene duplication event, and since then, primates have had this trichromatic vision. But there are monkeys that do not see red, and they're even within our evolutionary tree. So, what's, so what is the situation with humans? That's what everyone wants to know. People have tested this, and like I said, there are a lot of, there's a lot of confounding with gender in these, te in these tests, but I think even the, the results of gender differences is interesting as well. And I know certainly that marketing firms really capitalize on these differences, and you, you, I'm sure you see it and you've seen it before. But so how do they test for this? There have been um, uh, many different studies on color preferences between males and females, um, but essentially one of kind of the larger studies took the yellow-blue spectrum and the red-green spectrum. They isolated monochromatic hues out of it. And they had participants look at a screen and they had to react quickly. So they only had two seconds to answer the question and they went through a battery of tests. There were about 208 participants in this study and then later there have been other studies since. And they asked them kind of, you know, silly things like what's your favorite color and what's your least favorite color, but then they start really getting into which one is more like, which one is more closer to blue, which one does not fit the red spectrum, which one is the odd one out, and they show three shades of red that are very close to each other and one's maybe a little bit more brown, and they ask the individuals kind of with a quick reflex to respond, and what they find, you know, they find these color preference data that is like really, like all the marketing folks, my sister's in marketing and in, in journalism, so she knows this study very well. Men and women both like blue, women like purple more, no one likes the browns. Um, women like soft colors, you know this when you go on Instagram or any interior design website. And then women like tints, meaning white added, and men like shades, generally speaking. Obviously, there are individual differences, which is black added. But I think what's really interesting here in these experiments is that women were consistently able to better discriminate very close shades. And this difference on the yellow-blue spectrum was small, but had a much larger departure on the red-green spectrum, which is where, as we mentioned, the red-green cone opsins are on the X chromosome. Um, and then women were more accurate, were better at identifying pure monochromatic hues, which, you know, that, that just may be kind of a color lexicon difference, which there has been a few studies showing that women just have a greater color vocabulary than men. But nonetheless, it supports this possibility 
that women have improved spectral sensitivity, that they can discriminate more nanometers at a higher level than men in general. Obviously, there will always be exceptions, but there's this possibility, and you could see how if being on the X chromosome, it could introduce the idea that men and women may actually be seeing color differently. To me, this makes perfect sense. I think this experiment has been run millions of times at Home Depot, and in my experience painting two nurseries, um, I definitely see color better than my husband, but that's anecdotal and not scientific. I think, though, it introduces this concept that's really interesting, that we may be actually seeing different worlds, and not just males and women, males and females, but you know, each individual may be perceiving their own world. And I think this really came to the forefront with this you know, Instagram slash Twitter reference, which I debated if I should include, but you know, this, is, this dress was tweeted 73 million times. That's a massive sample size. So can I just get a poll of the audience? Who sees this dress as white and gold? I do too. Who's black and blue? Wow. OK, so interestingly, scientists have looked into it. And this I would say this room is actually contrary to the, act, the population. So here it seemed like there were more black and blues. But when they standard, initially the, the explanation for the difference was, oh, the contrast is different or the lighting is different. But a, a group of scientists in New York actually went through and methodically tested this. They put the dress on a white background and a blue background. And they, put, they standardized the lighting. They standardized the way you were viewing the photograph. And still, there was a massive discrepancy in the fact that people were seeing this dress in different colors. And interestingly, more women were seeing it in the white and gold spectrum, which is where I fall into, and as well as people that were uh, in the kind of older demographic of the respondents were seeing it in the white and gold spectrum. The dress is actually blue and black, which blue blows my mind because I see this as white and gold in every single version of the photo, um, but that's what it is. But it, I think that it's just, it really, you know, we all are having our individual vision experiences. So another kind of support for that is squinting, right? We squint. What we're doing is we're using our ocular muscles to contract on our globe. And then people don't have good, uh, don't have good myopic refraction. They squint in the classroom. And you're changing the curvature of your cornea. And you're actually changing the curvature of your lens because you're altering your ciliary body muscle. But essentially, you can move your refraction by a few diopters, and that will give you a different perception of the world. And it could completely change how you view an individual, as in this photo. For me, this is like a creepy person at first. And then like when I squint, I see like Jessica Alba smiling at me, um, which is much more pleasant. <laughs> so beyond just the vision differences that, we, um, that, we, that I mentioned, there are also differences in how we use vision and when we use it and what we're focusing on. And this kind of literature is much more expansive and even harder to parse out what is vision and what is other cognitive or perceptive realms. But there have been really interesting and well-designed well um, studies evaluating fixation preferences of individuals. So they show males and females that are healthy with good vision of video and they use an eye tracker to follow how they are monitoring this video. And women tend to focus on the eyes of the participant, and they tend to have the same kind of responsive emotion as the person in the video. And men tend to focus on the mouth. Um, and they, it's almost like they're trying to lip read or something more often. And then they incorporate all these other aspects to the um, background of it. And they, they uh, have you know balls come in and planes or another individual. And basically, they found that men are much more likely to, to break fixation with any motion in the background of this, of this video. So it, it's really interesting. And you know, there's so many other studies in this. There's cognitive studies showing that women respond more negatively to a face with a negative emotion. They have greater amygdala activation. There's perceptions of body size related to the actual perceptions of the, the size of your visual field based on your actual body size, as well as others.
So I had to put in a plug for ophthalmology because I am an ophthalmologist. I'm looking into this work. Um, it's very, there's not, there's really nothing in our literature about it. But in ophthalmology, women carry a disproportionate burden of ophthalmic disease. And it is much more than you would expect just from aging or outliving alone. And when you look into our textbooks, you see this is more prevalent in women, this is more prevalent in men. But then kind of that next step of why is this more common in men and women has not really been taken. There has been some preliminary evidence that shows there may be hormone regulation in both the vitreous, the gel of the eye, as well as the retina. Um, that really changes blood flow or alters kind of dynamics of the retinal function, particularly in the kind of supporting cells, the astrocytes. Um, but before this, when I was still working on this, it was really more focused on disparities in care and more gender aspects. But recently, uh, Google kind of disrupted our space, and now there's been another study showing that when they did artificial intelligence on fundus photographs, so those image of the back of the eye, and they asked the computer to identify cardiovascular risk factor. The computer was able to predict the gender of the fundus image 97% of the time, which like blew people's minds. There's no ophthalmologist that can right now tell you what the gender of a fundus photo is. So it makes me feel like we just aren't looking we don't know what we're looking for, but there is something to find there. Because if the computer can find it, so can we, I think. So future directions, I have a lot of work to do. I would love to you know, hear if anyone else is interested in this work. Um, and then you know, the conclusions, men and women may in fact see the world differently. It seems like the kind of best literature here supports the possibility for a difference in spectral sensitivity, particularly on the red-green spectrum for women. Men may have. A higher focal sharp visual acuity, at least at that super threshold range. But really, the current state of research is insufficient to draw any you know, meaningful conclusions. So a lot more is needed. So email me if you have any questions or would like to talk more about vision. <laughs>